The names and labels that we give to things allow us to concentrate our attention to their nature, guided by the intuition and the associations that the name elicits. Every name represents an analogy or a metaphor to another object or a concept in reality. It is an interesting chain of cultural heritage. And of course, it accelerates our understanding as we leapfrog through those intuitions into better gathering the meaning behind the words. But it also represents a little bit of a trap because we are pushed to take the analogy represented by the label to an extreme rather than using it just as a reference pointer. This week, we are going to talk about a specific set of terminologies, two different groups of concepts, their analogy and their defense. And we will try to conclude, hopefully, something useful about it. The terminology is that of a singularity. And the two concepts are the physical singularity at the center of a black hole on one hand and the technological singularity on the other. The Nobel Prize Committee assigned this year's Nobel Prize for Physics to three scientists. One who explored the theoretical concepts that led to an understanding of the nature of black holes and the probability of their formation. And two, whom independently were able to follow the experimental data in order to prove that the end, at the center of uh, our home galaxy, the Milky Way, there is a massive black hole. This is a wonderful example of the power of science and the two sides of scientific exploration, the theoretical progress and the experimental proofs that go hand in hand. When Einstein formulated the general theory of relativity that analyzes uh, the role of uh, gravity and uh, the interaction between energy and mass and space-time as uh, they are evolving in our universe, he himself was surprised and somewhat alarmed that the theory predicted the existence of uh, specific conditions that may allow the formation of so-called singularities. A singularity is a particular point um, in um, a mathematical function where a certain value goes to infinity. A physical singularity is an impossibility as far as we know, rather than in mathematics where we can entertain ideas that are very abstract, detached from reality, and go to even further layers of abstraction without being hindered by what is possible, with our only guidance being the coherent set of statements that we must take into account as we develop new theorems and we prove them. In physics, we don't have this freedom. If we meet some conditions that lead to infinite magnitudes of certain variables, that has absolutely no role in our universe. So the discovery of the possibility that 
the general theory of relativity would lead to these singularities was concerning. Shortly after, it was established that these singularities, if they existed, would be shielded from the rest of the universe. So they may exist, but we never actually encounter and interact with a so-called naked singularity. The singularity is behind what we call an event horizon. And the event horizon is such that it represents a one-way membrane. You can traverse it going towards uh, the singularity, but you cannot come back. Not only you, but nothing can come back from the event horizon. The current nomenclature around these objects uh, is that of black holes. A black hole is black, indeed, because the light that goes towards it cannot bounce back, reflected by the singularity inside the black hole, and the event horizon of the black hole is a point beyond which, actually a sphere, uh, where if you are closer than that um, frontier towards the center of the sphere, you cannot turn back, and not only you, but not even light uh, can turn back because um, the mass that creates the gravitational field requires a certain acceleration in order to um, describe an orbit that is not bound around, but can, for example, reach your eyes if we are talking about the photon. And if the mass is large enough and the radius is of a certain kind, then the acceleration needed in order to uh, free the orbit to leave uh, uh, the proximity of uh, the black hole is a speed larger than the speed of light, which is universally understood to be a maximum speed in our universe. Originally, as these concepts were understood, it appeared that only under extremely rare conditions black holes could form. And Roger Penrose, uh, the name of the recipient of the Nobel Prize uh, on the theoretical part, actually discovered that instead black holes can form under much more generous conditions, much more widely possible conditions. And the theory of relativity, the general theory of relativity was formulated in 1916. Um, the concept of black holes was uh, started to emerge around the 30s and uh, Penrose's work uh, happened in the 60s. Even closer to today, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, Lee Smolin established an even more surprising result. It looks like that not only um, black holes exist, not only black holes can form, not only the conditions under which black holes form are more uh, permissive, but actually our universe appears to produce the maximum number of black holes possible without itself collapsing on a single black hole. It would appear as if the universe is optimized to be a black hole generating machine. 
And no, we have absolutely no idea what this actually means. What are the implications? On the experimental side, the quest has been equally intriguing and, and magnificent. Imagine setting out and being persistent and precise and really believing in your mission strong enough that for 20 years you collect data. And it is not data that it is easy to come by. You collect the data of the stars that you can image with your telescopes that are the closest to the center of our galaxy. Tens of thousands of light years away. And you keep watching their orbits. And of course, all the mathematical calculations needed, all the error correction, all the even um, availability of newer and newer instruments uh, that allow you to make these observations at a higher degree of precision and confidence show you that yes, these stars are on an elliptical orbit, depending from their mass, depending from their uh, momentum, but each of them seems to be orbiting something that is itself not visible. And then, based on the equations of motion that originally were formulated by Kepler and then enhanced by Newton and enhanced by Einstein, you can calculate the mass of that invisible object that forces the stars in their orbits. And you can conclude that yes, that object which cannot be seen has the mass of approximately 4 million times the mass of our Sun. And the only thing we know of today that can be as compact and as massive and still completely invisible, not emitting any radiation, is a black hole. So the theoretical side and the experimental side concluded really something wonderful of an object that was extremely exotic, posited to be maybe even impossible, looked at with great concern and, and uh, with wariness on the side of even one of the fathers uh, that made possible the concept to emerge. And this allowed understanding that indeed the object exists and understanding its parameters, its nature. As a matter of fact, we have today all kinds of understandings and expectations of the nature and the behavior of black holes. Whether they are rotating and how fast and what does that mean with respect of the uh, nature of space-time around them. Whether their interaction with uh, quantum systems uh, makes uh, some even more complicated and strange mechanisms to emerge by which even though nothing can leave a black hole, black holes very, very slowly evaporate as quantum pairs of particles being born half in, half out of uh, the event horizon take away mass, energy and information from the black hole. And of course, also very recently, the merger of black holes. Two black holes orbiting each other ever faster, ever closer until the event horizons touch and they become one single object. Now, I always 
uh, like uh, to make connections between different layers and different uh, fields. And we have been talking about an analogous concept that we call the technological singularity, where rather than talking about the membrane of uh, space-time representing the event horizon, the event horizon for the technological singularity is uh, in, in time uh, through the history of uh, the development of our technologies and in particular the emergence of artificial intelligence that is able to modify itself in order to improve uh, its own workings. And um, the various people active in the field of understanding the consequences of these concepts and uh, the implications of those technologies and their applications um, have formed originally uh, a point of view that saw the technological singularity as something impenetrable. Similarly to how originally we saw black holes as uh, something that we couldn't go beyond. Uh, we, we, we were supposed to stop even trying to understand what could happen after the technological singularity. But today, that is not the case anymore. We are starting to formulate all kinds of theories and we are starting to experiment at least on paper, with what are the parameters that could lead to different kinds of technological singularity. And since we are the ones giving rise to the tools that become autonomous and generate the, technical, the technological singularity itself, when we look at the available alternatives, we are then able to pick the ones that are most beneficial to us. And rather than the technological singularity representing an impenetrable final moment, we are now starting to look at what is a past singularitarian world going to look like? What is going to happen beyond the times of the technological singularity? How will the artificial intelligences that will shape the world and the universe act? And how will humanity find its role interacting, coexisting with these artificial intelligences. Now, we are closer uh, to uh, the formulation of the original theory. Hasn't, there hasn't been enough time to establish yet um, all the details uh, that the physicists uh, have had over the course of more than 100 years they had at uh, their disposal. There are a lot of things that we don't know. To be honest, there are still a lot of things we don't know about black holes as well. But in uh, the field of artificial intelligence and the technological singularity, it is really important that uh, we get things right. Uh, we don't have the luxury of observing uh, tens or hundreds or thousands of uh, uh, independent events and then look uh, and pick what uh, is uh, the one that uh, is proving a particular theory that, uh, that we want to, to confirm. Uh, we don't have uh, alternative experiments to carry out. We only have planet Earth, we only have the human civilization, we only have, very likely, one chance to get it right. That is why a lot of people are extremely concerned about, one, the lack of 
deep understanding of the power of artificial intelligence among both the general public, the policymakers, but also many of the technologists. And that is why a lot of people want to uh, have more resources dedicated to understanding what are the right conditions for the safety and security of artificial general intelligence for beneficial AGI to emerge so that humanity can thrive alongside these uh, new protagonists of the trajectory of our civilization. Now, the analogies of these two sets of uh, labels and, and terminologies and theories and experiments cannot go too far. Um, it is not uh, the case that the parameters and the variables characterizing black holes can be taken as an inspiration for understanding the nature of AI. Uh, also, uh, too many people take uh, the root of the word, singularity, uh, literally. And they pretend to give a further meaning by talking about singular experiences and uh, uniqueness and or the solitude. Um, none of that. None of that has any relevance to what actually the topic at hand is. Sure. You're welcome to explore other branches uh, of uh, philosophy uh, or um, understanding linguistics uh, or ethics, uh, but the uh, interpretation of the root of the words as they apply uh, to these phenomena uh, is likely to lead uh, people who are not specialists astray rather than helping them in a better understanding of what we are actually talking about. So, there may be one exception to this. And that is our insufficient understanding of the frequency of technological civilizations in the universe, their ability to survive or inability to survive, and the formation of technological singularities. If we indeed start to understand the trajectory, the dynamics, and the nature of a post-singularitarian world, we may be better equipped in looking out in the universe and try to observe and record the traces of extraterrestrial technological civilizations that have progressed through the technological singularity to build a post-singularitarian civilization. And if and when we do that, resolving the Fermi paradox that asks why, until now, we haven't been able to observe alien civilizations, we may conclude that the universe is not only maximizing the number of black holes, but the universe is also a machine to optimally build the maximum number possible of technological singularities leading to the maximum number possible in the universe of post-singularitarian civilizations. Now, wouldn't that be a surprising analogy and connection in the two fields?